Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump, or Bat Gap as people call it, is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done 399 of them as of today. So next week, this guy has the distinction of being number 400. Um, if uh, you haven't seen this before and would like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu and you'll find all the previous ones. Interview, I mean, organized and categorized in, in various ways. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, uh, there's a donate button on every page of the site. Um, today's guest is Mike Jenkins. Hello, Mike. Hello. Mike is in the UK. Um, he was trained as an actor and has worked in theaters in London and around the UK. He later worked as a performing arts teacher and customer services trainer and now creates and manages websites to help people connect with their audience. But that's not why I'm interviewing him. Uh, <laughs> he has written two stage plays, a growing collection of poetry, and is a good writer, by the way. There was, uh, I really liked your dark cafe story, which um, oh, yes. pertains yeah. to awakening and all, but maybe we'll talk about that. And, um, and he's always been drawn to expressing his own perception and perspectives and exploring that of others through the creative arts. Mike loves to talk, sing, walk, read, write, cook, eat, and sleep. Not necessarily in that order. No. <laughs> <laughs> and to help others feel and know the deep joy, grace, and peace at the center of all life. After many years of mental and emotional distress in his 20s and a diagnosis of cancer at the age of 29, Mike began an intense spiritual search that led him to teachings on non-duality that sparked a series of awakenings and set him on a journey to integrate those shifts into everyday life. <clears throat> Um, so we're going to talk about that. I particularly like that last s sentence and last part of the last sentence, a series of awakenings that set you on a journey to integrate those shifts into everyday life. Because sometimes awakening is presented in such a way that it sounds like a black and white, cut and dried, on and off kind of thing. Oh, I awakened, you know, <laughs> and I'm done, I'm finished. And um, to my experience, Personally and observationally, it seems more like a series of awakenings is more appropriate terminology. And also, integrating those shifts into everyday life is huge and perhaps yeah. a lifelong undertaking. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's very much how I feel now. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't initially, you know, when, when, when the first sort of um, experience occurred, the first sort of um, effective awakening, um, for me, it was powerful. It wasn't one of these, um, you know, uh, angels and sort of dramatic moments that some people describe. Um, but it was powerful enough to, to sort of make me feel for for a while at least that 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 whole game of you know seeking to be something outside of myself and seeking for completion outside of myself was over. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely in the last couple of years, it's become very clear to me that. Um, if you're coming from a place of, um, you know, clear seeing, seeing things clearly, seeing things as if you're awake and certainly seeing things as if for the first time, there's, a, there's definitely a process of integrating that into ordinary life. Um, that I seem to be surrounded by quite a lot of people um, who really aren't interested in, in, in this journey. <laughs> you know, um, there's ordinary people in my ordinary life, family, friends, co-workers, um, who might have some sort of interest in it, but then and it's quite a good marker really for, for those of us who do um, collect together and go to meetings and retreats and, and listen to teachers and read experiences. It's quite a good um, you know litmus test really to be surrounded by those people. Um, and I have a lot of them in, in my life who, who say, oh, so, you know, where's your awakening now <laughs> you know where, where, where so is this how is this what awakened living is like then you know you getting angry about something insignificant like traffic or you know these sorts of things so it's it's definitely a process of integration for me and and, and I say series of awakenings because for me um, it's just been that way you know I felt very very much early on I began blogging about um, these experiences in 2010 um, and I spoke a, a lot then that it was my sort of gut feeling, if you like, that for me, awakening was a gradual thing, that it was gradually unfolding, that there was, you know, it, it felt very much like a structure of um, egocentricity, if you like, was like this big building 
this solid building and initially um, there was this sort of collapse of part of it, it some of the central structures um, through that initial waking up they, they became destroyed and so you know some of the stronger elements just were, were knocked out in that first first um, event if you like first awakening and then over the years you know over the you know, following seven years there's just been this series of little sort of if you like final collapsing of that structure um, and I don't really have any sense that the structure is completely gone or what bits of it are still standing but it seems to me that the, if I really want to get analytical about that I just have to look at my my life I just have to look at the relationships I have and the way that um, you know the way that things are different in my life as a result of that. Mm. Yeah, Ramdas said, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your parents. Um. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Or anyone who pushes your buttons, you know. I mean, right. I've got. Interestingly enough, um, it seems to me that the, the minute we really um, move into a space where we can handle, if you like, more than we did before, mm -hmm. um, because to me, you know, um, I'll often describe you know, being in an awakened space or just a, 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 awakening itself as, you know, this this infinite, endless capacity. Um, and in fact, that word seems to be coming to me a lot lately and other people have used it, but this capacity to allow and to hold all this sort of infinite openness, this open space that, that, that gives rise to everything. And so interestingly enough, when when for me, my experience has been if I remain open to that, very quickly things come into that space almost to test it you know almost to test the sort of um stability uh, in, in that that ground of being um so some of some of my new friends that i've made over the past couple of years um interestingly enough are seem able to sort of uh, push those buttons in me that, that in the past um might i just might not be able to deal with it much more readily um, and interestingly enough, I'm, I'm thinking of one friend in particular, I'm not going to name any names, but this friend in particular. He'll know who he is. Al yeah. <laughs> also, uh, well, she actually, but anyway, <laughs> but also um, spends quite a lot of time, in my opinion, you know, residing in and, and, and exploring an open space. Um, and interestingly enough, um, we seem to sort of almost like teachers for each other, trigger each other and, and, and you know, test that, that um, stability. Um, so yeah going and live with your family for for a week most definitely and and also what do, i know i'm rambling on about this but what i find interesting is that it seems to be that you know those figures like the people that test us the most when you're establishing yourself in this awake space it seems to be life doesn't seem to hold back on sending those people to you you know in whatever form do you have children <laughs> no i have no children i was wondering because there's those little pictures on the wall behind you i was wondering if oh. those are little kids pictures or something oh these no no they're postcards actually that people uh -huh. have sent me or um they're, they're little cards that people said birthday cards and things i see because um, i was just thinking children are also good little testers absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah um and i'll be honest um i i'm you know yes obviously if i had children come into my life there'd, there'd, there'd be an acceptance of that but i don't feel in the place where i would willingly um have children i'm gay i'm in a, in a gay in a, in a, in a same-sex relationship uh -huh. um, and, and where i am at the moment i don't feel you know called to um adopt or attempt to have children right um, well, it was just a curious, it was just a case in point kind of example because, you know, kid, yeah. kids are a great, you know, button pushers. Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, and animals sometimes as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, although less so. I think that's why a lot of people really like animal relationships because they, they're they not as complex as human beings, you know. No, no, definitely. <laughs> but it's an interesting point because certainly for me, um, awakening is really sort of um, most useful I think in relationship yeah you know in relationship to other people but even in relationship to our environment to the world um, to um, other people to animals to, to ideas you know um, and it certainly does seem to be whether you know the sort of the rubber hits the road or you know we, we walk our talk um, yeah so yeah. on your openness point you know I, I, there's a lot of synonyms we could use you know, pure consciousness or unbounded awareness or vastness or openness. And I think people know what we're talking about. But I often think of that as a kind of a solvent in a way, because um, to whatever, you know, when it when it dawns, I mean, w when that sort of inner freedom dawns, it tends to begin to dissolve things that um, are calcified or, you know, rig rigidly uh, set in one's own makeup perhaps, and in one's, yeah. in one's larger world. 
and um, and then you know the muddies, the waters can get muddied a bit as things are dissolving, and then you you kind of work those things out, and maybe there's another expansion, and then more more dissolving of, of stuff, and that cycle can just continue on for even yeah. po even post you know if if we want to delineate a, a or demarcate an awakening point, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. you know, then post awakening it seems to continue. You know, you just I agree. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I have to agree, um, and that's how it's been for me. Is that um, and that you're right. It's a very good way of describing it. When I think of things dissolving, I think of you know liquid. I think of um, a, you know sort of an, an open you know vast sort of um, space of liquid. And and stuff comes into that, and it just it just dissolves much much easy, more easily, much quicker. Yeah. Um, and so it's my sense that um, you know, let's just say we were able to sort of click our fingers, and the entire human race was living from an awakened space, <laughs> the same way that you know Christ figures or Buddha figures were doing. Um, I would imagine this is just a guess. I've no way of knowing, but I would imagine that stuff would still come into those waters. It's just that we'd be operating from a place that would just deal with it much more skillfully and effectively and um, deal with it in an awakened way, you know, um, because life is life, isn't it? You know, there's there's still going to be death. There's still going to be suffering, what we might call suffering. You know, there's still going to be um, things that we don't like happening. Um, it's just that the way we kind of process that and deal with it and respond to it, um, it is different from 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 a different from an awakened perspective. Yeah. Um, so well, I think it's very high, very hypothetical to suggest, of course, that we could click our fingers and the whole world would would awaken. But, you know, if that were to happen, I think that 99% of the suffering and, and troubles that exist in the world would, would dissolve very quickly because most of them are man-made. Uh, but, you yeah. know, there could always be an alien invasion or an asteroid strike or something like yeah. that that would yes. threaten us all. And, you know... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But interestingly enough, you know, what what would that be like? Knowing that that threat could potentially be there, what would it be like if we weren't living every day under the fear of that? You know, I think um, certainly for me, I mean, m all through my twenties, um, the way I lived was in reaction to a, a sort of generally constant sense of unease and discomfort. You know, either in the extreme form of anxiety. Um, and very sort of, you know, tense, upset with myself and how I was feeling. Uh, more on the more mild side, just a, just a background sense of, you know, um, dis unease, you know, sort of a sense of something missing, you know, um, which certainly when I was much younger wasn't very loud. But um, I was thinking this morning, actually, about, um, about where I was, sort of, if we go back before I started writing the blog, you know, back about eight or eight or ten years, um, what seemed to happen before this big sort of um, first awakening um, experience um, was that that sense of something really mi missing in my life, although I just didn't know what, you know, I'd tried to, I'd moved from job to job, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd attempted to sort of find completion in relationships, you know, um, things that were bringing me pleasure, I would chase after and you know, constantly seek to have better things and nicer things and improve stuff. Like everybody. But, yeah, like everybody, like, like, like the sort of normal sense of just, you know, acquiring in the world or going out there and, you know, living in the world and getting and wanting and doing and being. Um, but in the end, the last sort of couple of years, there was just this intense, like the volume had been turned up really loud, of just longing with actually often with no object in mind like a state of perpetual feeling like I was hungry mm -hmm. and needing something, but actually never really knowing what it was. It's almost like just feeling that sense of um, you know, desire, if you like, or, or craving or, you know, feeling of lack, um, feeling that in isolation without actually, you know, so if anyone was to say, well, what, what is it that you want? I wouldn't have known what to say. I just knew, well, actually what I wanted was for that feeling to go away, <laughs> that mm. feeling of being empty. To um, to die, which eventually did happen. Yeah, well, that's a that's a stage of progress, I would say, because most people could answer that question. They would say, well, if I only had a a boyfriend or a, a new car or a better house or a better job, or you know, they mm -hmm. can actually put a label on what it is they they think they want. Um, yeah. But you had apparently gotten to the point where you'd done all those things, and still there was that craving or longing or wanting, and you began to realize that it was something more fundamental that maybe wasn't going to get 
you know, fulfilled externally, although you probably wouldn't have been able to articulate it that way at the time. No, no, exactly. Um, and how I feel now is that I still want things for, for you know, comfort in life, you know, and, you know, that there are things that I go out into the world and seek to create or make happen. But I think if I was to describe it, the thing that the the, the shift has been that I don't want them because I think it's going to give me something I don't have already. Mm, yeah. You know, it, it's like wanting them for completion. It's like icing on the cake. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so that feels much better. In fact, in, in a way, it seems to make our efforts in the world, and certainly for me, um, it makes my efforts just much more skillful, I guess, or just much, much more organised. I don't know. I'm struggling for words, but just less sort of chaotic, you know, yeah. when I was when I was seeking to sort of, you know, um, look for a new job or, you know, write a play or, or do something in my life, um, you know, attract a partner or whatever, when it was coming from that place of, you know, just desperation, you know, I was often wouldn't, wasn't working well, <laughs> which is, you know, a surprise. So. Well, here's an analogy that might help. Let's say you're penniless and somebody gives you ten dollars it's like whoa ten dollars fantastic uh or let's say you, you know you, you hardly have a penny to your name and you lose ten dollars it's a tragedy it's it, so your, mm. your world really gets rocked up and down by little gains and losses but let's say you're yeah. a millionaire you know somebody gives you ten dollars hey thanks no big deal or you lose ten dollars no big deal so you have that mm. baseline of wealth um yes and you know re little relative gains and losses are just like ripples on the surface of an ocean so i, I think yes. pe people get the metaphor yeah yeah definitely definitely yeah. um so when you had when you discovered you had cancer um what kind of cancer do you mind my asking it was mouth cancer so it was on the floor of my mouth really um, had you been smoking or? yeah since i was about 17. That probably um, caused it yeah, they reckoned it was a lifestyle cancer, so smoking and and I didn't drink. Yeah, I wasn't an alcoholic, but I drank a lot as a student in my twenties. Yeah. Um, uh, so did that freak you out pretty bad when you discovered you had it? Um, yes, it did. I mean, when I I didn't really freak me out to the degree that some of the mental and emotional distress freaked me out in my twenties, um, my early twenties, but. Yeah, it did. And in a way, I think that, you know, I've often mentioned before in, in my blog that that period was, was what I consider to be the beginning, really, of a very conscious and intentional spiritual search. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think back to that time, um, there was certainly an element of shock um, mm -hmm. and um, in a way just letting go and, you know, going along to the consultations, you know, it, it sort of surrendering really and letting the doctors take care of things. Mm. Um, and also in that time, there was, if I think back and, and, and um, place myself there again, there was certainly a sense of, I suppose, peace or, or quiet within me, you know, emotionally, I'm really speaking emotionally and mentally. There wasn't a lot of mental noise at that time. And there was a lot of um, generally just peaceful sort of feeling, hmm. um, which isn't uncommon in, you know, in people who have been given, you know, sort of frightening diagnoses. Hmm. Um, but this was pre-awakening though. Yeah, it was really. Um, and then, you know, the, the treatment for that went well. Um, I had an operation which was 12 hours long. I had two, uh, well, I had six weeks of radiotherapy and during that six week period, two sessions of chemotherapy. Um, and that was all I needed. I went back for, for um, you know, consultations every every month, really, for, for about five years. And each time they said, well, you're healing well, nothing's come back, there's been no recurrence. Good. And then after five years, they gave me the all clear. <laughs> but in that period, in that five year period, then certainly I would say my you know, spiritual search began in earnest and yeah. I was you know, a, a rampant sort of spiritual <laughs> consumer in that sense. A lot of stuff I'd never come across, you know, um, I was brought up as a, a Catholic or Irish mother, so Catholic upbringing and not particularly strict, you know, um, but, you know, went to a Catholic school. So God was something that I was familiar with, but I, I still now can't quote the Bible. I'm not a great Bible scholar and none of my family are. Um, but certainly, you know, I began to meditate. Um, I began to read quite widely um, spiritual texts, um, not a great deal of classical spiritual text, I'll be honest. Um, I followed some teachers on YouTube, I listened to audio tapes, um, listened to Eckhart Tolle a lot for a couple of years, 
um, experienced some shifts through that. And then, you know, in my own life, um, you know, that that sort of recognition started to come about, you know, 2010, which was really just four years after the cancer. So, mm. Just yeah. for the sake of illustration, um, God forbid, if you were to get another cancer diagnosis now, you know, re uh, recurrence or whatever they call it, how do you mm -hmm. think, how would you contrast how you would probably react with how you felt the first time around? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I have thought about that and I do think about it. Um, I don't really know. Um, I think probably I would be, um, there'd be, there'd be a different sort of response now. Perhaps, um, perhaps some of it would be similar. I don't know. Um, I have a feeling you'd have, you'd have more equanimity now, you know, and kind of a broader, yeah. broader perspective on the whole thing. I certainly would feel that, um, but whether or not I'd still feel, I think I'd still feel some fear and some anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but I do feel in a way, you know, what, what was clear to me, you know, um, a few years after this is what really happened in that period is I sort of made peace with my own death. Yeah. You know, I, um, I contemplated death a lot in that period. Um, and you know, even now I'll still go back to, I think it's actually a very good practice. Um, if people want to sort of experience what it's like to have a sense of no self, well, then you can kind of almost just sit and meditate and think about and contemplate your own death, you know, and in that, in that, in that um, meditation experience, um, some people can experience a, 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 you know, a falling away of a, a sense of self. That's how Ramana um, had his awakening. Yeah, he exactly. Lay down on the ground and pretended yes. he was dead. He even held his breath, you know, and <laughs> yes. it caused a yeah. shift. Yeah, yeah, and I think it can with a lot of people. Um, you often see those pictures of monks holding skulls and contemplating, you know, the mm. ephemeral nature of life and so on. Yes, yeah, and there's something quite beautiful about that because you know our culture just doesn't want to look at it. You know, it's um, it really doesn't want to deal with it because it doesn't feel nice. You know. Um, and I think certainly for me now, um, I'm less I'm less judgmental, I guess, about what comes into my world, whether it's internally feelings in, in the body or thoughts or situations or, or externally in my life. I'm kind of less um, judgmental about it. It's not that I don't make judgments, but I kind of don't mind so much what comes because I, I sort of I, I feel just more sure in the um, just in the knowing that it will go as well, that everything has its death, you know, yeah. everything comes and everything goes. Um, and when you mentioned that, you know, a, awakened, you know, mind, if you like, or awakened self as being like this, this, this um, space where things dissolve um, and where things are healed and resolved, um, you know, that, that, that's in a way what it's like, stuff comes in, but it's also free to go. I yeah. used to describe it very early as feeling like I was slippery inside. Mm. You know, things would come in and, you know, I might, you know, have a, um, you know, an experience of sadness or grief or loss or anger or whatever it was. And then it, it would just sort of go, you know, <laughs> be free to go. Yeah, that's very nice. Um, I can think of so many examples of things that, you know, various teachers and so on have said in that regard. Um, you know, but I, Nisargadatta comes to mind of, uh, describing how he experiences something that might be upsetting. He said it, you know, it just causes this momentary fluctuation and kind of passes through me. Or Eckhart Tolle, since you mentioned him, he, he gives that example of the ducks on the pond getting into a little <laughs> fight, you know, <laughs> yes, and, remember, and, then, yeah. and then they shake off their tail feathers yeah, and, yeah, and a yeah, few yeah. seconds later they're back to just being <laughs> ducks. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and you know what? It really is like that. Um, you know, it's that, that doesn't mean to say it's always easy to, for people to be around me, you know, yeah. um, and I'm not special in that regard. I mean, I know I know several of my friends, you know, would never think of themselves as awakened and would never, never describe this sort of process in this way. But they might, you know, have a spat about something and then, you know what, it's gone and it's forgotten about. Um, it's had its moment, you know, it's resolved, it's seen through, it's passed on and, yeah. and it's sort of returned to this space. And that that in a way, you know, if, if anybody said to me, oh, why, why would you talk about this? You know, why would you write about it? And one of the reasons is because that's just such a wonderful, um, you know, approach to life. Um, if, you, if you can live life in a way where, you know, you can get to be all the things that you are, do all the things that you do as a human being, but you don't hold on to them and they're, they're not, you know, they're not um, causing any um, dysfunction in you. 
yeah. then that's freedom. We're sort of free, you know, freely being as we are. There's actually physiological research on this sort of thing. There's studies on meditators where they subject them to stressful stimuli and mm -hmm. you know measure the reaction in terms of galvanic skin response or various other measures and um, compare that to people who don't meditate. And you know there's a, there's a, an initial reaction that's appropriate, but then there's a very rapid adaptation among the meditators where they don't continually get triggered by the stressful stimuli once it has been adjusted to, you know, once they've, I don't yes. know, the, the physiology sort of learns to adapt and it doesn't <clears throat> hold on to the, to the stress mm. or, the, or the agitation that, that was caused by the stimulus, um, which ha of course has tremendous implications for PTSD and things absolutely. like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in a way, since we were talking about the cancer, in my mind, I've no, I've no real doubt, really, that um, that you know, that, that there were a combination of factors that that led to that tumor appearing in my mouth. Um, one of them was obviously smoking. Another one was probably drinking. Um, I mean, some people just don't have the, the the some people's physical biological systems are more sensitive than others. So although I wasn't a rampant alcoholic, I probably drank more than my system could really handle as a young man. Um, so smoking, drinking, staying up late, you know, eating all the wrong foods, bad nutrition. And add on top of that about 10 years of sincerely sometimes wishing just to be dead mm. in a sort of suicidal thought way and being just depressed and unhappy and anxious and constant, you know, often on sort of high sort of intensity alert in terms of my nervous system. Mm. There's no doubt in my mind that they were all contributing factors yeah. to the appearance of the tumor, you know. Stuff takes a toll. So, mm. um, how do you figure that, you know, through all this uh, and this cancer and everything, <coughs> Excuse me. How was it that spirituality came on your radar? I mean, because some people go through the kinds of things you've just described in their twenties, and they continue to go through them in their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties. And mm -hmm. and uh, so, what do you think was that got you onto spirituality? Um, I don't know really. Um, I guess I'd always been interested in things that. I mean, certainly I was always interested in philosophy. I never studied it, but you know, kind of, um, I would like to philosophize with friends, um, been interested in the bigger questions, even as a young person. I love poetry, I like to write poetry. Um, and I read a lot of poetry as a young man. Um, and a lot of the plays that I was interested in, as an actor, I, ne I didn't always perform in the sorts of plays that I loved. But, um, but that a lot of the plays that I was drawn to, um, to read and to go and watch, um, uh, often dealt with life's big themes. Um, so I guess there was always an openness to that kind of thing. Um, and I think really once I started to discover there were lots of spiritual writings and teachers um, talking about spirituality, but it wasn't talking about religion. It wasn't talking about a, some sort of prescriptive path. Um, then I kind of, you know, that sort of you know, piqued my interest really. Um, I think certainly growing up and coming out as a gay man at the age of 18, I was really quite anti-traditional um, organised religion, simply because to my mind it had done a great deal of harm um, to, um, to minorities in society or, you know, sections of society that just didn't fit in with their normative, you know, view of things. Yeah. Um, How old are so, you now? I'm 40. I turned 40. Ah, at the end so of that last was year. like 22 years ago, and and obviously views on that were much less tolerant then than they are now. Although, yeah, they, although they still got a ways to go. <laughs> yeah, indeed they have. Um, and yes, yes, they were less tolerant. Although interestingly enough, in in England in the 1990s, which is when I was a student and you know, sort of if you like coming to terms with my sexuality and, and discovering who I was, um, you know, things were generally a bit more relaxed in the 1990s here in England, but you know, um, legislation hadn't really come that far. I think during my during my teens, the age of consent was re re reduced from 21 to 18, I think. Mm. Um, so equality wasn't quite there until a few years later. Um, but interestingly enough, I, and, and we do still find this in, in um, certainly not obviously in organized religion, but sometimes even in spiritual circles, um, you know, sense of maturity and um, deeper understanding around sex, um, sexual identity, sexual activity, um, orientation, gender, identity, all those sorts of things is still quite a sort of um, uncomfortable, you know, topic um, 
for, for, for many of us. Um, partly, I think that's cultural. There are some cultures that are just sort of more reserved about the body and sex, you know. Um, but, um, I, yeah, I do think that, um, you know, it, that in a way sort of turned me off of um, organised religion, you know. Certainly the, the faith I've been brought up in, the Catholic faith, um, had such a horrific and, um, you know, horrible record in terms of walking its own, you know, walking the truth of its own teachings, you know, horrific abuse in the Catholic Church um, of children and just in general, you know, yeah. um, that it just didn't, you know, I know that's not been everybody's experience. I know there are lots of people who've had, um, you know, and I've met Christians who've had a, a wonderful um, experience of a Christian upbringing, um, you know, before in my life as a young, a young man and, and since then. Um, Were you but, ever the victim of that in the church? No, 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 I wasn't. No, no, thankfully not. Um, uh, but and I don't really know anyone who's had. But I mean, it was all, always in the papers, you know, even in the 90s, you know, yeah. um, and recently even more so. I mean, I know the one, I think one problem with with, uh, you know, our modern connected world is there's so much news, constant rolling news that it's easy to miss a lot. And, and, and I don't certainly don't, you know, sit with the. TV or the radio on constantly or read every paper but um but definitely you know there's there's you know dozens and dozens of cases of um historic you know uh, there's lots of um inquiries and trials and investigations going on in the UK into historic um instances of child abuse in the corridors of power and sure. local authorities and all sorts so actually um I think weirdly enough being you know coming out as a gay man at the age of 18 and, and I think this is similar for, for lots of people who are in some kind of minority. It doesn't have to be around sexuality. But um, funnily enough, I think that we somehow seem to sort of spend so much longer as an outsider, if you like, to, um, you know, sort of norms of society um, or to the majority, you know, kind of co always being on the outside somehow. That, um, that interestingly enough, I think in a way that gives some sort of you know, grounding um, in 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 a sense of you know uh, freedom, if you like. Um, yeah, I think I know what you mean. Um, I mean, that wasn't my issue, but I was kind of re well. This a lot of kids are like this, but I was kind of rebellious as a kid. You know, it's like I dropped out of high school. I would I would like on a whim go on the hit hit the road, stick my thumb out and go to Boston or someplace, you know, without yeah. any without any money or plan or anything else. Just kinda like <laughs> trusting in whatever to to make mm. to work things out for me. And and so there was a certain sort of um, following one's impulses mm. which, which of course mm. can be very reckless at, at times, but it, And would have been frowned upon. Yeah. In lots of ways. Yeah. But you know, I don't know. I, I, um, so, um, so do you think that, um, just to f wrap up what we were just talking about, so we, we're all aware of how horrible established religions have been and in many respects still are with, with regard to, um, you know, a, a number of things, um, mm. but uh, in sexuality in particular, or homosexuality, but what do you think about, um, the contemporary spiritual but not religious scene, you know, the non-dual scene, all the various teachers, do you think that there's a, a big improvement in, in attitudes and, you know, generally people have more accepting liberal perspectives? Yes, I think I think in a way that the contemporary spiritual scene kind of tends to attract a more liberal mindset, but although not always. Um, so I think for most people, probably in the contemporary spiritual scene, whether it's non-dual or slightly more new age or whatever, I think probably, you know, sexual identity and sexual orientation and all that sort of thing is probably just a bit of a blind spot. You know, um, it's something most people don't think about, you know. Haven't really um, worked through the issues in their own minds, you mean? Well, no, I don't necessarily mean that. Um, and maybe they haven't. Um, but in a way, you know, most people, you know, often don't need to, you know, because they don't see a problem with it, you know. Um, I mean, yes, I think people can experience problems around sex and sexual expression, whatever their um, orientation, gay, straight, bi, anywhere in between. Um, but I think probably it seems to sit, uh, for me, it, it seems that, you know, um, issues of sexual expression and sexual, just sexuality in general, seem to sort of sit under the surface in most 
most sort of scenes I've come across, you know, whether it's, um, you know, non-duality, Western non-duality teachers in London or, um, you know, or groups that meet for meditation and what have you. Sit under um, the surface, meaning it's just not discussed or Meaning, it, yeah, it's just not with? discussed. Or, yeah, that's my, that's my perception. In a repressive um, sort of way or because it's just not relevant to what they're saying? I think maybe probably for the most because it's not relevant. Although you'd have to really speak to individuals, I think, to get a sense of whether or not that was a repressive, um, you know, pushing down of things. But mm. certainly, I mean, I, I feel generally, if you sort of paint a picture of, of um, the United Kingdom, of, you know, the, the sort of English sensibility about it, there's, there's a real discomfort, I think, as a, as a culture around sex and, mm. and, and, and sexuality. Um, although well, that's changed every, changing as every year, you know. As a case in point, I mean, our friend Francis Bennett is undergoing a transition these days um, and mm. uh, to be being a woman. And um, he has just done a tour over there in the UK and other places in Europe. So how did that go in terms of audience reaction? And, you know, were, did, were people just sort of shrugging their shoulders and say, OK, fine, let's get on with the satsang? Or was it an issue for a lot of people? Um, it wasn't an issue at all. Um, Great. Uh, you know, Nicely enough. I mean, that's not to say people probably don't have questions and people do and we're able to ask them. Mm -hmm. um, and what was lovely for me being involved with Francis in this recent tour actually was to see how um, really, you know, it's the communication of a truth, really. It, it seems that actually that's the most powerful thing. Um, and so while there may be some people who just find um, you know, the concept of uh, the idea that a person can be born into a body that doesn't quite fit their identity, their sexual identity, their um, gender identity, um, it can seem alien or seem, you know, like some sort of um, confusion. Um, actually, um, I mean, for first of all, Francis spoke about it very, very well um, and you know, gave people the opportunity to ask questions. Um, but in actual fact, um, Certainly, from my you know understanding, Francis as I do, and, and spending a lot of time with her, um, it's made the communication clearer um, for, for for what she's talking about. You know, um, which for me, you know, it, it is a wonderful thing because, um, you know, having met Francis, one of the things that has happened in my life is that there's been much more inclusion and less of a sort of spiritual bypassing of the stuff that I just didn't want to deal with, which often was personal, you know, it was often the, the stuff around, you know, personal history or personal um, characteristics um, that, you know, I certainly two or three years ago, I probably would have rather just explained away as, you know, oh, just, you know, passing phenomena or, or whatever. But in actual fact, um, you know, being, being awake, if you like, and, and returning to an awakened space just facilitates a much more honest um, dealing with with the stuff we need to, to deal with, you know, the stuff that comes up. Um, and stuff just does keep, keep coming up, you know. Um, yeah. so, I think, yeah. So are you saying that Francis's example kind of enabled you to deal with your own issues that might have been unconscious or subliminal to some extent? To, to, to sort of cure you of some degree of spiritual bias passing? Is that what you just said? Um, certainly, Francis is teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in, now it's really impossible to um, separate Francis's teaching from Francis's um, example of living in the world, you know, which is, which is why I find what she's doing such an incredibly courageous um, thing um, to be, if you like, a living example um, of everything that she's teaching, which is that you know, the absolute is appearing here as clear, open, you know, unconditional love. And that includes, it transcends, but also includes the personal sense of self, which is, you know, the egoic self, um, the characteristics of self, including every everything that we used to, you know, think of as our identity, and then maybe saw that that wasn't our identity in an initial awakening, is then sort of welcomed again um in in the later stages because for me i had no had no real understanding of the structure of these things and what what's been nice for me spending time with francis and um reading um you know the the the, the things that she writes and the teachings is that there's a very clear sort of um if you like anatomy of that that journey of awakening which i just didn't come across before because i just hadn't read it so so scholarly um 
So, and it seems to have made sense in, in my own experience that there's this period where you sort of, you know, initially you wake up out of this, this sort of confusion of being attached to uh, things that come and go in us, of being attached to um, feelings and thoughts and the past and all of that um, into this clear space. But then that's not the end of it because, you know, you can't sort of, if I, in a way, I try to cling to that probably a bit too long, mm. that witness conscious space or that space of, you know, um, the absolute. Um, there is a sense of not really wanting, for me, not wanting to come off of that mountain and into the, the mess of my life again. Mm. You know, because it's um, sort I, of like a refuge to just hang out there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's not to say that I, I mean I I really enjoy peace and silence, and if I can go and find it, I will. You know, I love mm. silence now in a way that I just couldn't handle when I was a young man. Um, and you know, and I meet a lot of you know my I've got teenage nephews, and they just have to have noise the whole time. Yeah. You know, um, but. Um, but having said that, now in the last two years, and and, and I say it was related to meeting Francis because that was two years ago, and um, I think just by osmosis, you know, helping with the website and having you being close to that, it's it's had that effect. And certainly, most recently, um, you know, the you know in in her transition has made, if you like, the you know our um, identities with 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 sexual identity and sexual orientation much more on 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 the talking topic really because you can't it's you know it's something that in in francis's life you can't didn't you can't sort of ignore it it's a phys, it's a physical you know thing in front of you yeah uh, so so it's been incredible really to, to to be to be around that yeah since we're on this topic and since this is a topic that i don't this that doesn't get discussed that much on back yet let's let's pursue mm. it just a little bit more because um it's interesting, and it might be very helpful for a lot of people. Um, I mean, as a as a gay man who came out 22 years ago, and for the last four, five, six years has been has had this spiritual orientation, and is something of a spiritual teacher. Um, what kind of um, assumptions, or stereotypes, or misconceptions, or or attitudes uh, have you found prevalent and kind of ingrained in people's mentalities? regarding the whole issue of sexuality and spirituality that um, you feel could use more enlightening, more uh, clar clarification or, or mm. straightening out, mm. you know? Yeah, sure. Well, I think um, the main thing that comes to mind is just an obsession on sex itself. You know, um, one, one, one of the big sort of Kind of assumptions i guess and this this happens happens had certainly happened in my life and to me long before um you know long before any sort of uh, interest in spirituality was that um that you know depending on your sexual orientation um so you know people would meet me and they'd either realize or they'd ask or they'd know and they'd oh, they'd see that i was gay or i would tell them i was gay if they asked um and then there's just this sort of over, uh, overly inappropriate fascination with with th that <laughs> meaning that that they say, and also some some people think that they can understand who you are because they know now that you're gay. You as know, as so, if oh, that were all there is to you. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and frankly, you know, the way I feel is that a lot of you know a lot of the gay community, if there even is such a thing anymore. Um, uh, have done a lot to sort of, um, uh, you know, reinforce um, that. Yes, yeah, really, that's the word I'm looking for. Re reinforce that, you know, because, um, and I understand why. I'm certainly not having a go at any gay community for that. I mean, frankly, because for so many years, um, gay people, you know, transgendered people, um, LGBTQI, whatever the acronym we're using these days is, um, really didn't have anywhere to go where they could safely express themselves. Right. You know. So they're the compensating, they just, letting off yeah, yeah, steam, yeah. so to speak. Exactly. Or even just, you know, uh, being in a, in a space where um, it's safe to do so, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, I think, one of the biggest um, stumbling blocks for, for most people is that there's this sort of obsession on what people do with their bodies in a sexual manner um, or in, in sexual activity and a huge number of assumptions um, about, first of all, whether that's right or wrong or natural or unnatural. Um, and secondly, that um, you can sort of somehow, you know, um, 
uh, make, make, make sort of an assessment of someone based on their sexual orientation, you know, which just doesn't really happen, you know, it, when among straight people, you know, straight people could meet each other, you know, a straight guy could meet another straight guy. You know, first of all, the conversation would never go, oh, by the way, you just must know I'm straight, unless one thinks you're straight. <laughs> That's like that. funny. <laughs> and, you know, and then the other one going, and then the other one thinking, ah, I see. All makes sense now, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's straight, you know. Of course it makes sense, you know. Yeah, he loves cars, you know. Loves cars and loves football, you know. Of course he's straight, you know. Why would you know? Yeah. It's a bit so. So when I tell people, you know, um, oh, I don't, you know, I don't really like, um, you know, a lot of West End musicals, or you know, or Judy Garland's okay, but you know, it's not. It's a bit boring. <laughs> then you, know, it, you sort of lose your sort of gay credentials. You, know, <laughs> you, you could actually write a very funny skit of some sort. You know, kind of reminds me of that scene in the Birdcage where Nathan Lane and Robin Williams were in that cafe having breakfast, and he and they, and Robin Williams was trying to teach Nathan Lane how to act straight. But you could you could create a great skit. You should do this. <laughs> yes, indeed. But the interesting thing is, I think um, most um, what what certainly the, the the kind of deeper sort of um, you know richness in going through that experience is more akin to what you were talking about in the sense of feeling somewhat like a, an outsider you know or somewhat otherly to to a lot of people and i think that's you know much more common um among all people you know and it just it's just sort of on the surface much more um uh, uh, you know uh, as a gay man or woman or lgbt um you know person because um you know we're sort of constantly having to sort of or realizing that, I mean, for me, there were no role models really it, growing up. You know, there was nobody that I could look at and go, ah, right, okay, they're, they're like me. Well, you had Elton they're, John, right? Yeah, you had sort of entertainers um, who often aren't the best role models. <laughs> you know. um, and also, I mean, for a very short time, I, I, um, I taught um, in, in a school, I taught drama um, in a school. Um, and Interestingly enough, you know, um, I I sort of it was an interesting experience for me because I sort of had no real I'd been you know I worked mostly as an actor, been around creative people, um, and so that's really a very generally quite a liberal you know experience. Um, creativity by I always used to say every artist or you know a creative artist has to be blasphemous. I used to use that word and say because you can't be worried about offending anybody really if you're creating great art. Mm. Um, but you know, being in a school, you know, in a community, was a completely different experience. And I, you know, I'd already spent a bit of time in, you know, the corporate world, um, you know, before that. So I was very well versed at being able to, you know, adopt a, you know, a very professional attitude, which I did. But I was certainly, it, it was very clear that we weren't, you know, I was not allowed to tell the children that I was gay. Right. Um, and you know, although I never personally came across any you know, um, severe prejudice directed at me, there was certainly this sense among, you know, uh, sort of parents, if you like, that, well, it's all right for Graham Norton on the television or that entertainer who's making a clown of himself. It's fine for them to be gay, but I wouldn't want a gay teacher or a gay doctor or a gay, or I wouldn't want anyone dealing with my children. Who was, and that's another sort of, um, you know, difficulty because, you know, we're just sort of, there's this, there's this assumption that it's a per per perversion or a dangerous thing, that, you know, mm. That we're all running around, you know, um, doing unmentionable things in the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was, um, I, I saw the cover of a Time magazine the other day, and I didn't get a chance to read the articles because I was just walking past it. But it was, uh, the whole cover story was something about how the whole concept of gender is, is at least with the younger generation, is really getting mm. redefined. I don't know if blurred would be the right word, but redefined. Redefined. And, yeah, and um, I'm just wondering from a spiritual perspective in terms of, you know, you, you, you alluded earlier to if we could snap our fingers and the whole world would be enlightened. All mm -hmm. right, so if we could snap our fingers and the whole world would be enlightened, you know, what do you think the whole gender issue would look like in such a world? I mean, in an ideal society, if there were such a thing, con composed of highly awake individuals, you know, how would that con contrast with what we have now? I think um, there would be much more fluidity around, um, much more open and accepted and 
unthreatened, uh, a sense of being unthreatened by the fluidity of gender identity and the fluidity of sexual orientation or sexual preference or sexual desire. Um, I've never really met anyone, if I speak to somebody for long enough, um, you know, I mean, providing they're, com they're not completely closed, um, I can either sense or get a feel for or they'll tell me that they've had sexual feelings for a person of the opposite sex. Um, doesn't mean to say that, that they are confused about that, but you know, I can look at, um, I can look at a, um, a female, uh, the female form and find it beautiful or even erotic or, you know, um, appealing in that way. It doesn't mean that I'm, you know, going to go and, uh, you know, live with a woman and marry a woman and that's going to be my identity. I think, you know, gender identity and sexual orientation are, mu in my opinion, my opinion are much more fluid um, than we would like them to be. Um, you know, so if I look within myself, I can find elements within me that are very, very feminine. Um, and I can also find elements within me that are very, very masculine. And they're, they're in a dance, they're, they're, they're not fixed. You know, there, there are times when I, you know, naturally, what, what's called out of me is a very strong, you know, clear, masculine sense of being in the world. And what other times there's that what what's called out of me uh, or what appears as me or how I act is might be very feminine. Um, but it might be a very strong, commanding, clear, wise feminine sense. You know, so I think actually these binary, I mean, I don't know much about gender politics. I don't read much about it. And there's probably plenty of other people more qualified to talk about it. But my sense of it is that uh, the, the world we've created, the society we've created for ourselves is quite binary. It is black and white, you mm. know, it is, it is, you know, it's, it, it functions in that way. It's almost like it, it sort of suits, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the, the, those who lead us as a population to have it that way. But anyway, that's another topic. Um, I think that probably all of these identities are much, would be much more fluid. And actually there'd be no, there'd be no um, fear around that. Um, yeah. I mean, if you buy into reincarnation theory, um, that whole understanding, we've all been everything, you know. Mm, uh, mm. We've, we've been women, we've been men, we've been what, you know. And, yes. and we, we go from lifetime to lifetime and, and incarnate in term, as what we need to be in order to learn our lessons, the next mm. lessons we need to learn. Yeah, and definitely, you know, we can experience just with the, you know, with our imagination, a, a lot of what that's like now, you know, I find that, um, you know, it only takes a, a little bit of time to intentionally sit with someone or something um, to, to sort of see yourself in it or in that person, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I would kind of imagine an, an, an enlightened race of beings um, would probably resolve conflicts that way, you know, they would somehow meet that person or that entity on the level of absolute reality, first of all, recognize that the absolute reality in you is the same absolute reality in me, and that is our, excuse me, our common sort of inheritance, our common identity, our common primal sense of beingness, and then from that resolve differences, you know, um, and and sort of um, you know, learn to live alongside each other. Hmm. Um, it seems to be that that actually, you know, when we really love something, um, we've come to see ourselves in it, you know, whether that's a rock or a stone or another person that you actually, you sort of meet that person on a, you know, on a deeper level, but at the same time, in form also, sort of meeting, I guess, meeting them in emptiness, and then, you know, you meeting them in form at the same time. Mm. Yeah, I'm reminded of that Rumi quote about the, the field beyond right oh, and yes. wrong, you know, I'll meet you there. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's a beautiful, beautiful quote. Um, and I think of that one often. In fact, I often write it on my blog at the end of things. Um, it's so beautiful because actually in relationship that... You might as well tell us the quote since you probably can have it, have it memorized. And... I think probably out beyond our ideas of wrong, right and wrongdoing, um, there is a field. I'll meet you there. I've probably right. not done it justice. That's about it. Better. It's around about that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, so I guess gender identity, sexual identity, orientation, all these things really I think are probably much more, much more fluid than, um, than we'd like. It's like when things, it's, it's, it's like with anything isn't it, you know, we, you know, we don't really like it when things change too much because it threatens our sense of um, security. Mm. If we don't know what things are, 
but coming from this space, you you know, it doesn't take much to just return and remind myself. Well, actually, I don't really know what anything is. You know, it's um, it's sort of not knowing. It uh, facilitates this incredible um, capacity to to sort of accept and to deal with, to be open to, um, and and see things in a new way, um, which can be healthy and helpful. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I think that the um, the ability to not need not grasp at mm. adamant certainties or conclusions about things i mean there's yeah. there's often that you know there's that don't know mind phrase and and it's not that one doesn't know anything you know we know all kinds of things but it it has to do with the the sort of rigidity or adamancy with which we think we know mm. things you know be yeah because who who actually does know anything with absolute certainty and you know name yeah. me anything that you can know with absolute certainty <laughs> it's yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and there's nothing you know um when you really look so then it's like you were saying earlier that this sense of you know being you know being this space in which stuff comes in and it, it gets to be and it, if it dissolves and transforms and moves um, there's a, here's a Bible book? quote for you. Jesus, Jesus, since you said you didn't know any, Jesus uh, <laughs> said, you know, judge not lest you be judged. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly, you know. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, there, there are probably many others that would, 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 would seek that as well. Um, so, yeah, for me, I think, um, you know, identity, if you like, um, it, is something that, is play you know it's 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 not ultimately who we are you know yeah um so i mean but certainly for, i mean this is interesting talking about sexual orientation for me it was very clear at the age of 18 that what the world thought was a gay man was not who i was right and i think that's probably what i was clumsily trying to get at earlier by saying you know if you don't fit into you know something where you really know who you are because it's confirmed all around you you might get a sense of this freedom a bit earlier than others is because because I've never felt like any label has ever described who I am. Mm -hmm. And I used to say that as a 19, 20 year old man, you know, the first um, the first gay bar that I walked into, I looked around and first of all, I thought, well, this is good because there are people here holding hands and it's OK. They're not going to get beaten up. But the second thought that came in straight after that was that I don't feel like any of that. I don't feel like. I relate on a really, you know, profound level to any of these people here. And I saw on that very first night some of the same prejudice um, from from some gay men towards lesbians. Huh. And I just thought, how? I wow. mean, and obviously we know how, you know, but initially as a young 18 year old, I thought, how can you, you know, have gone through life? Because this was from older gay men right. towards, you know, younger lesbians. And it wasn't it wasn't cruel. It was, you know playful sort of bitching but you know it wasn't particularly nice for me and I didn't I thought yeah, I'd come to somewhere where I could finally sort of you know <laughs> be free of all that sort of judgment and yeah. and you know um the stuff and and I just thought how can you go through life you know being so sort of how you know that person will have gone through some some prejudice and then and then sort of be so sort of um unaccepting or bitchy towards um you know the lesbians in the bar and I just thought mm. and even at that age I sort of realized you know you can't can't really you know that's that's just the way people are a lot of the time and you know yeah. labels just you know, labels are for clothes not people <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in case anybody listening is wondering at this point what this has to do with awakening or spirituality <laughs> and and all that i, I kind of think it does you know it's um as we started out the interview by discussing it's one thing to realize one's true nature, to have a taste of transcendence or unboundedness and, and whatnot. It's another thing to integrate it into life, into the personality, into one's behavior. And, um, you know, there are so many ingrained tendencies, I, I think they call them vasanas in Sanskrit, that um, are deeply etched in, in our psyches, in our nervous systems. And, and that stuff has to be worked out. And, and, you know, what Mike and I are discussing here is one area of such tendencies, one such vasanas, which is kind of a big deal in, in our society these days. It's a big cultural issue, a political issue. And, and yeah. um, so it's something that I think pretty much everybody has to come to terms with in one way or another, whether they like it or not. Exactly. And it's a big deal for, for you know, um, on the one level, you know, 
um, I am not my sexuality. So, you know, my sexual feelings and desires, um, that's not who I am, just yeah. in the same way it's not for any person. Right, you're not but your on, body, you're not your any, yeah, yeah, any of these individual so, expressions, you're bigger than that. Yeah, yeah. And yet, on the other hand, you know, for me to be able to sit here and talk to you knowing that this is being broadcast and it will be on YouTube and potentially seen by more people than normally see a video of mine, um, it's it's a huge um, advance for me to talk about these things and not feel within myself any sense of shame or um, guilt, mm -hmm. um, you know, or embarrassment. Um, that that's a that's a massive um, development in my life. You know, I always felt ashamed of um, myself in that way because that you know I didn't. <laughs> I, that was being reflected back at me. You know. Yeah. Um, people were not, this, yeah, people were making you feel that way. Yeah, yeah, or there they were certain, you know, certainly it's, it, 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 it's not so bad now, but there is a general view, um, you know, that, that's still in, in lots of parts of society around the world. I mean, in, 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 um, in Chechnya at the moment, there's horrific... Um, oh, right, yeah, I signed some horrific, petition about that the other day. Yeah, yeah. yeah me too, a horrific um, acts of violence against people because of their sexuality. So we're not, as a race, completely beyond it. But then we're not beyond a lot of things. Um, so certainly for me, this is this, you know, this is related to, um, you know, awakening and being in the world as an awakened being because, um, you know, awakening on the contrary to what we might sometimes think at the beginning of our search for enlightenment or at the beginning of our spiritual life to uh, seek, seek a different way. Um, it doesn't rub out all of these diff difficult things, you know. Um, it's certainly not the, um, on one level, you, you know, it's winning, it, it's, it's sort of living the greatest, most valuable prize of all, but it looks nothing like, you know, what we thought it might do at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I, one thing I've been expressing a lot lately, and this really seems to sum up where I am in terms of, you know, um, you know, living a life that's true to this essence of peace and joy and um, unconditional love within me, to be true to that, you, I am living, going through a period of just integrating all of that um, understanding in every part of my life. Um, and one of the things that's been really clear to me is that initially I began my spiritual awakening because I was, I began seeking spiritual awakening because I was suffering and I wanted to awaken from that. I wanted to wake up or from, wake up out of that and be free of it. And initially there was that temporary, you know, maybe even for sort of four years, I would say, I kept dwelling in that place of, you know, non-conceptual awareness, you know, whatever we call it. Um, and yet the journey wasn't over because now it's it's taking that understanding and that experience of non-conceptual awareness or witness consciousness or clear you know no self taking that understanding and experience into the world of my own life into the personal life um so i'm waking i feel very much now that i'm waking up to my life not from it mm. um you know which is wonderful because you know, not everything about that. I mean, a lot of people will describe, you know, just dwelling in no mind as a very dry, distant place. And yes, it is on some level. But for me, and I spent about two years, you know, in, in a different flat I was living in at the time, a different apartment, um, just in love with, you know, the cupboard door and, you know, <laughs> um, really simple things, you know. Um, and I can still find that now, you know, I can still, you know, go out into the world, we'll just simply sit with something long enough and you experience its essence, you know, including people. Yeah. A friend of mine, um, Susanna Marie, said that one time too, that she just went through a phase where she would find herself just sitting and staring at a rock or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just, exactly. just sort of loving it and having this deep yes. experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is lovely because in a way, when you, when you sort of realize that that's within you, you know, that that's what you are, that in a way, what you are is gazing at what the rock is at the most elemental level. Then you have this confidence. It certainly feels like that for me. You have this confidence in the world that actually nothing can take that away. Once you establish that, that it's like it's like you can never really, you know, be sort of bored or lonely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it might you might get periods. I mean, of course, I'll get times I sit here and I think, oh, you know, I want to do something interesting. Sure. But if there really isn't anything to do, you know, if I can't, then 
you know, just sort of sitting with that is a beautiful thing, you know, it's mm. wonderful. This kind of uh, segues us into another thing I want to talk to you about, which is actually an elaboration of what we started with. And, you know, if, it, if anybody listening has more questions about the whole gender identity, sexual stuff that we've been talking about, feel free to send in a question um, and we'll come back to it. But um, last week or so I was listening to a, a talk that Stephen Bodian gave at the Science Non-Duality Conference and he was talking a lot about the contrast between the direct and progressive paths. And I thought that would make a great panel discussion for the SAND conference. And um, so st I started chatting with Stephen about that and we, I just submitted a proposal yesterday and hopefully we'll have Rupert Spira and Robert Thurman involved too, although they haven't been told yet. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> And it was a panel discussion. And the, uh, the reason I think it's interesting and relevant to what you and I are talking about is that um, it, it's a perennial discussion. I mean, it's been going back probably thousands of years about, you know, direct realization versus this long drawn out, you know, uh, path that that one has to take in order to reach enlightenment and um, I think that it may be a false distinction in the sense that um, one can from the outset one can have a, a clear glimpse of one's true nature uh, but that doesn't mean you're finished there can yeah. then be you know no end to the uh, clarification and integration of that in, in one's life um, so I don't know. It, it's uh, mm. Mm. It, it, oh, yeah. What I, are your I, thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, I can. I, I agree with where you're going with that. Actually, um, mm -hmm. you know, is it a question? Is it a question of a direct path or a progressive path? Um, and I would say, well, both, because um, I think even if you take a direct path, you, know, you take a direct path to one's awakening. Well, then after you awaken. The progressive part comes in because you've you've just sort of still live a you know have many years in the body, um, so um, that would be my feeling. I know that perhaps the question isn't necessarily asking that that maybe you just take longer on the progressive path to gradually awaken, um, but I would say that even if you take the direct path and the direct path is successful and you awaken in a direct way very quickly, um, then there's still the job of living an awakened life which I think can only be progressive. Yeah. Well, I wonder it's how many right examples right. there actually are of people who just awaken just like that. I mean, there are yeah, people I who don't. there are people who read books that say you're already enlightened and they say, "Oh, great, I'm already enlightened, you know, got check that off my bucket list." But um <laughs> <laughs> but yes. you know, you wonder how if you if they were able to pop into Ramana Maharshi's perspective suddenly and contrast it yeah. with theirs, would it really be the same? I don't know. Yeah, I think I think each 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 sort of expression of awakened living would be different. But um, but I I see what you're saying. I think probably that that no one really has an instant awakening. And even if they do, I mean, in a way, every moment of awakening is out of time and is instant anyway, because it's sort of, uh, you know, occupying a, a timeless realm. Um, but um, I would say even those sort of familiar stories that some of us may have heard about stories of instant awakening. Um, when you really sort of read deeply into those, if the person has written a lot of books, you know, if the teacher's written a lot of books, or there's a lot of material to look through, you probably find somewhere that, you know, that, I mean, I'm thinking particularly of Eckhart Tolle, you know, um, yeah. I listened to loads of talks of his, um, like hours and hours worth, um, that, that, that I think sounds true produced. Um, and, you know, he mentions you have to listen to, you know, 20, 30 hours worth of stuff or read, you know, because he's not written that many books. Um, but you do hear him say, you know, well, after that initial awakening, there was a period of three or four years where I had to get used to living that way, you know, get it readjust. It's like it's like sort of, you know, wearing a new, you know, you're getting into a new skin almost. Yeah. You know? Not um, only that, but even now, I bet you if you were to talk to him, which I hope to do one day, uh, he would say, yeah, I'm still growing, you know, I'm still yeah. evolving it. Adya Shanti certainly yeah. does. And actually, I heard from somebody who, I forget who it was, but they somehow or other knew Eckhart back in the day before he had his awakening and became famous and everything. And they said he was an ardent seeker. He was reading all kinds of stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. practicing this and that. I, so I don't know for sure, but I, I did hear that. And so it wasn't yeah. completely out of the blue. And then there's always the issue, of, you know, I happen to think, some disagree with this, that uh, these people who have these sudden profound awakenings, 
something is fructifying which they had actually built up to in previous life. And, um, yes, th there yeah. had been a lot of spiritual practice, and then you know they hadn't been much interested in it in this life, but then all of a sudden kapow, and it was just the resumption of mm, uh, mm. A, a momentum that they had already established. Mm, mm. I could see, I could see how, how that could be the case, and also I would say even if you even if you sort of leave the question of um, past lives to one side, I would say that 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 we can be practicing in our lives without really thinking of it as practice. That's a good point. You know. For me, um, the constant dissatisfaction with the way life was was my main practice. Yeah. <laughs> um, sort of, if you like, suffering was my main practice, or or dissatisfaction and feeling unfulfilled was my practice for many years, because um, that brought me, if you like, to the period where I just, you know, that was all I felt, and yeah. that 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 almost got so sort of loud to the point where it would just, yeah, you know, it, it zeroed everything else out. That's a very good point. It created an intense yearning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So kind of, I mean, I've had probably, you know, several dark nights of the soul in that sense that I've had very many periods in my life where um, everything just seemed to have gone wrong. You know, the, the, everything went dark, you know, no money, no job, no relationship, nowhere to live on several occasions, you know, in that situation. Um, and, you know, it can only get so dark before it start, the dawn starts to come. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think often... We, and also, you know, I mean, I, I've, I do encourage people to um, practice in their lives, you know. I mean, I'm not a great one for routine meditation, but that's not really the point of it. The point is that, you know, I might take what I um, experience in meditation into um, a feeling of um, unease in the body, you know, or if I have an argument with somebody, um, you know, is actually using that, uh, using a, a sort of sense of just exploring the um the timeless or unconditional love in those instances which is which is sort of practice as well but um what i was going to say is that i feel that um a lot of people don't think of themselves as practicing very much but you know reading facebook commenting on spirituality blogs and talking about spirituality yeah. watching youtube videos, putting your I attention that, on this stuff exactly exactly it, it all amounts to um like you say building up momentum if you like and a, and a will and a desire and an intention to to, to wake up, you know, to, to, to see things a different way. Yeah. And I, I agree, sorry to go on, but I agree right. that, I agree that um, along with Adi Shanti and probably Eckhart Tolle as well, and I know Francis um, thinks this way, is that my sense is that, you know, yes, there may be a, a, a sort of um, delineated period where you might say, well, that's when I began to wake up. But actually from that point onwards, and I think even in the clearest most enlightened you know awakened being if they're still in a body they're still here on the planet in a body then that just goes on it's like awakened like you actually i think the type the subtitle of of your website of buddha at the gas pump says it perfectly it's awakening yeah. people you know it's not awakened it's it used to awakening. be awakened and we changed it? i, I realized yeah. that that was wrong <laughs> yeah exactly and, and that's it because because it's like we awaken in every moment then, you know, it's yeah. um, being awake every moment and it just doesn't end, you know. Yeah. Um, possibly even on the metaphysical, non-physical non plane, who's to say, you know. Yeah, I tend to think that. I mean, it's just a, an assumption, but I get, yeah. I get that sense. Um, and also, like, you know, on, well, around this point, there's... Uh, a lot of times the whole notion of seeking is poo-pooed, you know. Um, oh, give up the search, stop being a seeker and all that stuff. And I think that does a disservice to people who are in that phase very strongly, who, who are yearning and aren't satisfied and are, are looking for something. It's like you can't just stop looking. It's like saying to a hungry man, oh, give up the hunger. You know, you, just mm. ha you actually have to fulfill it with something and then it's naturally going to drop off. Yeah, I think so. Um... And I, I, I read a lot of those teachings and, and listened to a lot of teachers for, you know, who, who, who um, you know, counseled that, encouraged that, you know, who suggested you know, their teaching was, um, you know, um, stop seeking um, or see that actually what you're looking for is the seeking itself. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, a lot of that helped me. You yeah. know, that was very helpful. At the yeah, there was a flip How, side to that argument. Yeah. yeah. However, it didn't ferment for, for a number of years. It didn't stop me seeking. Right. You know, um, seeking did stop um, of its own accord. It seemed, you know, that um, um, that did drop away. And, and in fact, the biggest thing I was just reflecting on what has been different in my life um, since then. And I think the biggest 
most noticeable thing for me is that this sense of feeling unfulfilled, this nagging sort of background sense that, you know, feeling un dissatisfied or unfulfilled is just not there anymore. Right. You know, um, I, and as I say, it's easy for me to tell that because it was almost like that was up full volume before. <laughs> I couldn't rest for a minute. You know, I was constantly, you know, even if I was sat still, I was constantly, you know, oh, I want something, I need something, I've got to do something, you know, and I was never, you know, I never had any sort of serious addiction to drugs, but it was like that within me, you know, it was like a sort of sense of, you know, just couldn't rest. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that's gone, you know, there's a sense now of, well, this is enough, you know, yeah. um, and I still do things, but you know. And did it go know. because at some point you decided, hey, I'm tired of seeking, I'm going to stop seeking? Or was it more that you kind of found somehow some fulfillment dawned and then almost in retrospect you realized, hey, I'm not, I don't have that seeking craving thing going on anymore. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was really in the recognition that, um, that what I, what I was looking for was already here. Yeah. That was, um, that, that was a huge, um, that really was, was, was sort of the, the initial breaking away. Like I say, this, it felt like this big land mass of um, suffering or, you know, some might call it this, the, the uh, big element of self-structure just fell away. Mm. Um, and that was upon the recognition of, oh my goodness me, it's here. Yeah. You know, like the whole glasses on the top of the head thing or um, that actually what I was looking for in everything, even, and I would say even in our worldly seeking, um, you know, I might say I want to go out there and buy a new car or, you know, look for somewhere else to live. Um, but if, I, and, and that, that's fine to go and do those things, I have absolutely no problem with that. And I'd, I'd like to do some of those things. Um, but it's like the essence of what I want, you know, if I think about that, well, really, I want those things so that I can feel something, you know, I want to feel more satisfied, more fulfilled, you know, I want to enjoy that, you know, I want the comfort it might bring. But really, the essence of all of that is already, it's available now, you know, and what I was seeking through, it just no, it didn't occur to me until it, until some of you know um, the sort of more modern non-duality teachers of non-dual wisdom, if you like, you know, Advaita Vedanta teachers that we we, we see around, um, uh, said that, pointed in that way, you know, that, that what 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 you're looking for is already here, yeah. and you are you are what you seek, you know, that was a huge um, huge shift for me, you know, because I hadn't considered that before. Yeah. Let me just make one quick point and then I want to talk about what you just said. And, and that one point is just that for me, the, uh, a helpful way of phrasing it is to just say that, um, you know, the, the seeking energy or seeking tendency gives rise to or gives way to just a, an ongoing sense of wonder and adventure and exploration mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and you know, words like mm -hmm. that where, you know, certainly the journey continues, but the, it, no, it yes. continues on a platform of fulfillment. Uh, yes. rather than a platform yeah. of, view, of of emptiness. Uh, yeah, exactly, or lack, absolutely. Yeah. I completely agree. So it's almost like then, it's not so much seeking anymore, it's more just being in the world or creating. Yeah, exploring, you know. having fun exploring, in a way. Exploring, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Not seeking, I mean, it was always the distinction for me that now if I'm, if I'm seeking for something, it's to, it's to enjoy that in and of itself not to find some sense of completion within it you know that what's gone is the belief that i must have that thing or i must do this or be that to to feel whole and complete and satisfied yeah because you already like feel whole and complete and satisfied yeah, yeah, regardless exactly. of whether or not you get that thing yeah yeah, yeah exactly and that's yeah. what's lovely is that actually then everything you do in the world is an expression of your wholeness and completeness and your beingness yeah like you say, from that platform, from a platform of compl already being whole, already being complete, mm -hmm. everything you do in the world then is an expression of that completeness. Yeah, very um, nicely put. Yeah, it just feels so much better. You know, it's yeah. just, you know the relief of that is just, um, is still now when I, you know, if I look again, I think, oh yeah, it's like discovering that for the first time. I find it fascinating that um, you and many others um, experience such a radical shift just by hearing the teaching of you know that what you're seeking is what you are you know that kind of talk um, it's like it's almost like you were primed for that you know you were you were ready for that you'd gotten to a point I mean maybe if you'd heard it 20 years before it wouldn't have done the trick but you had reached a point at which just that knowledge 
evokes mm -hmm. a, a big mm -hmm. or reorientation in you. Completely, and it, it did feel like that. Um, and I didn't go to loads of meetings. I went to I went a few times to um, to hear Jeff Foster speak and mm -hmm. sat with him in meetings for a few times. Um, and maybe one or two others, but I did. But I watched a lot, you know, and read a lot. Yeah. And it was like that. I mean, certainly when I first read, in fact, the first time I picked up The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, a friend had come to stay with me, um, and she was reading it, and I was intrigued, and I picked it up. And you know, it was like looking reading a foreign language. It made no <laughs> sense to me. Yeah. You know, I I was interested, you know, and I thought, mm, what is it? But I just couldn't follow it. You know, it wasn't making any sense. And then a couple of years later, um, actually, while I was recovering. Um, from the cancer and I was now really spiritually interested in seeking these things and I'd heard about Eckhart Tolle, I thought, ah, that's that book that Laura was reading yeah. and so I went and got it and it was just like, it, it was just speaking my language then, you know, yeah. um, and it was to do with that, it was, I think I probably was primed and ready and was, was there was a willingness to hear and a willingness to see and the same thing with, you know, um, uh, with Tony Parsons, with Jeff Foster, with a lot of those those teachers sharing things, you know, 10 years ago, um, seven years ago, really, for me, was the first time I encountered a lot of that. Um, it just suddenly was like, this is just making total sense. Mm -hmm. And I've shown those videos to other people and they just cannot, they're like, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Yeah. You know? Well, part yeah. of the whole rationale of, of Bat Gap is just the, to throw out so many different voices yes. in, that, um, you know, people can find something that resonates with them. and. Very often I'll put out an interview and, you know, they'll, they'll get feedback. So one person will say, that's the worst one you ever did. Another person will say, that's the best one you ever did, you know, <laughs> because it just, you know, different strokes for different folks. Yeah, different flavors and different different things resonate at different times. Um, you know, there have been some some expressions I came across seven years ago and I just think, oh, I just don't get it at all. It's, I don't like the way it's expressed. So it doesn't doesn't feel right to me. And then, you know, five years later, you read it again and go, oh, actually, it's the same because it's the same with poetry or you know Shakespeare. Anything that's got some ring of truth to it, you know, some real depth. You come back to it later in life. It just goes deeper. It's got layers, layers to it that you know. Yeah. Um, that, that 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 unfold. You know, that's very so. true. I mean, there are all kinds of books. You know, like the Bhagavad Gita or you know mm. books like that that you could read <laughs> for the rest of your life, and it, it becomes a new yeah. book every time because there's a deeper understanding that resonates. It, these books, a lot of these, this knowledge is it's crafted in such a way that it appeals to people at whatever level of yes experience they ha they have yeah i agree but it does seem to be that there needs to be um a kind of readiness i think is a good word a, a readiness to to hear um these teachings or to hear what's being you know pointed to it, particularly in that sense you know that you well, are that's true yeah um and a lot of the traditional teachers have said that too shankara ramana uh, you know, mm -hmm. they don't say one size fits all. They say, well, if, you know, Ramana would say to somebody, you know, well, you were that. And if they didn't get it, and then he'd say, well, do self-inquiry. And if, and if they, <laughs> yes, if they yes. couldn't relate to that, he'd say, okay, well, do some service. Go work in the kitchen. Feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, there are different things that um, are appropriate or suitable to, to people at different stages stages of their development and also to different types of people and one thing leads to the next yeah exactly yeah. Mm. so in your own case um, ha has it been primarily sort of watching videos and reading and contemplating and thinking or did you and have you and do you engage in some sort of spiritual practice to any extent mm. Mm. yes I did um, I meditate now still a bit i don't have a i don't have a um timetable meditation wow. practice but i spend time in silence sitting mm. um and and even you know seven years ago i, I in fact yeah 2010 through till about 2013 i was unemployed i wasn't working so i had a lot of time um i wrote a lot reflected reflective writing i've always written a diary in a journal um, but I was reflecting on self-inquiry processes and methods. I was reflecting on the teachings that I'd been listening to. Um, and I was exploring, um, you know, existence within myself, sense perceptions and, yeah. um, you know, just, just sort of experience. And 
Yeah, so I, I, I guess I do a lot of different types of practice that, you know, they're, they're, they're not um, perhaps all very um, thought of as strict kind of uh, you know, methodologies. Mm. Um, but certainly I do, you know. Um, I mean, to me, you know, just sort of spending time in the park or going going out for a walk in nature mindfully, you know, and sort of presently and, you know, um, consciously sort of just being in a space without thinking. And that's that's another incredible, um, you know, for me, place to be at, because when I first, heard, you know, the advice from Eckhart to say, well, just stop thinking. You know, <laughs> that's that's the key. Just stop thinking. And I thought Eckhart Tolle said that. Yeah, he did. Yeah, oh. it's actually in, 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 in some of the books, you know, mm. easier um, said than done. Well, yeah, and I just thought, whoa, you know, I, there's no way I can do that. I tried and tried and tried. But interestingly enough, um, you know, even before 2010, I was reading, you know, so this is from 2006 to 2010, really reading, um, you know, Eckhart Tolle a lot and listening to his stuff. Um, and interestingly enough, with more sort of just practice, it did become easier. Um, whereas now I feel that um, when I don't need to think, if I don't need to think, it, it just seems to be quite quiet. Yeah. And if there is thought going on, you know, if there's a momentum of thought going on in a way, um, it's more like, um, you know, I, I don't really listen to it that much unless I really think I need to. Yeah. You know? It's like you don't have three radio stations going in your head at the same time. It's relatively quiet. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've heard it. And I just, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I just don't really take it all that too seriously, unless it's something quite serious. You know, if I hear, you know, if I hear some commotion on the street and I think, oh, something's going on on the street, you know, it sounds like, you know, police cars and si sirens, I, I should get out of here. You know, I'd obviously <laughs> take that seriously. Sure. Um, but yeah, I just generally don't take anything too seriously that I think about. And if I do, I'll go away and, and decide to think about it. But, oh, okay, well, actually, I need to go away and contemplate this and think about it. So. Yeah. But this brings up an interesting point. I, I think that, um, you know, if we could describe the enlightened mind, it, it's not a mind that's utterly free of thoughts, but it's a mind that, that is efficient in its, in its thinking, that thoughts occur as and when they're appropriate. And uh, aside from that, the mind isn't cluttered with a million other thoughts that aren't appropriate. And so this is tremendously um, if conserve, conserving of energy. And the, yes. and the thoughts we do think can be much more powerful and the actions we take on those thoughts much more appropriate. We're not kind of scattering our, our energies in, in every direction. Yeah, no exactly. Purpose. And it's like, yes, exactly. So, so, yeah, it feels like you're just less attached to the thoughts that come into the mind. You know, they're not, um, and you know, there's less, I feel I make less conclusions about what I think. Mm -hmm. You know, when in my 20s, I had real, real problems with with mental health issues, you know, and and, and emotional disturbances um, and uh, had some quite frightening experiences in my very early 20s around, you know, sort of nervous breakdown, mental sort of emotional collapse type experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and they were terrifying because on some level I was believing what my mind was telling me. Um, and there's just less investment in that, you know. Um, as a creative, you know, my mind's always been quite creative. I can sit here and imagine cr in wonderful creative worlds and, you know, think about ideas and things. But um, but then that's that's sort of allowed to just play and then, you know, go its own way. Um, so it's not it's not that the mind's not capable of that. It's just that it doesn't really conclude too much more yeah. unless it's asked to uh. <laughs> make a conclusion. You know. In other words, you don't take your thoughts all that seriously. They, they yeah. happen. But it's not like you're totally convinced that what you're thinking it, therefore it must be true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is what a lot of people do, you know. Oh, I think such and such about Muslims or about gay people or yes. about about yes. Republicans or whatever. Therefore, it must be true. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, and interesting enough, I'm 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 challenged in that in that um, sense, um, in in by the people around me. You know, um, who are more because, certain of their opinions? Yeah, or um, you know, if there's something I really 
care about you know i can seem to really stick to it for a while so well i really want to do this you know and, and I, I there's reasons i don't want to do that today because we don't have time to do that and i want to go there and that's that's what i want to do and so it can seem like it's really really important to me which in that moment it might be which is might be why i'm sort of you know going out for my version of things yeah. um but really when it comes down to it um you know, it it doesn't it, there's there's less concern you know over what the mind says about things you know yeah um there really is um and you know like we were saying earlier um there can be this dance of um you know activity in life um in our lives you know uh, conversations interaction you know just life lived together with others um and all that that entails disagreements arguments whatever i'm quite fiery and feisty person um as well as you know enjoying being peaceful and quiet and generally unpredictable you know i'm sort of um I'm, I'm you know a lot of people who know me might say well you know mike's really um you know interesting person but he's not consistent you can't always predict how he's going to be on a particular day um and you know there's just sort of less investment in all of that which funnily enough if any of that is dysfunctional which i think when i was younger you know that way of being in the world was pretty dysfunctional. It wasn't necessarily serving me that well, um, and a lot of the people who cared for me, um, you know, found it difficult. But yeah. um, there's there's more a sense that you know, that's more just more functional when there's less investment in in the thinking that goes with it, and also the attachment to that as a who I am. Yeah, well, I think another good point comes out here, which is that um, you know we're talking about how more, I, I don't know what terminology, let's just say more enlightened mind for the sake of convenience is less attached to its opinions and um, less sort of adamant that, you know, my way or the highway, that kind of thing. Um, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, that is not to say that uh, such a person is going to just be wishy-washy, you know, whatever goes, yeah. you know, that, uh, you know, you, you can see many examples if we want to take well-known examples of people like Papaji or Ramana or Nisargadatta who had, you know, fiery determination when they set their mind on something and, you know, weren't about to be swayed by others' opinions. They mm. said, this is the way I want it to be, this is the way it's going to be. Um, mm. On the other hand, they could just totally turn on a dime and, and be, um, go with w whichever way the wind blew when it would when that <laughs> you know so it's it's a little unpredictable but it, let's not um stereotype and say that it has to be this way or that way and let's not yeah. let's not assume that you're just going to be a pushover necessarily if if yes. you're in this state yeah that's a very good point to make because i think that um certainly i i kind of wanted more peace and more uh, more relaxed experience of life when i began um you know seeking to awaken um, but in actual fact, well, as I said earlier, like awakening to my life, it's it's very clear to me that there are some sort of core aspects to my character or personality that that haven't, you know, that haven't sort of dissolved in a puff of sort of you know, um, enlightened smoke, you know, um, and act and actually I'm glad they haven't because they, you know, um, they're a sort of particular unique flavour to to who I am, and I think that that's a very yeah. interesting point that 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 actually maybe you know we become more sort of um you know determined in our in our in the things we care about from an awakened space yeah you know i think this idea that um this idea that you know being you know having an awake mind and body and you know, being being awake in the world just means that you're just oh you know just very passive you know everything's fine it, it doesn't matter you know so it's all okay anyway you know we, there's nothing really happening you know it sort of is you know there's some peace to be had in that and there's some there's some deep truth in that that sort of perspective but actually, um, I think sometimes, you know, coming from from a more enlightened, more awake um, perspective, almost always, I think, will bring out, will call out the best in us, you yeah. know. Um, so what, yeah, I, I mean, what I find and observe is that there's a paradox here where both of those things can true, can yeah. live in one life at the same time yes. there, there there can be this sort of laser like focus on uh, and you know determination to achieve a certain thing and at the same time this this sort of surrender to god's will um, yes and and oh, even on the very same point sometimes there can be the it it's like what is that verse in the gita you have control over action alone never over its fruits so there can be the laser like focus on achieving a certain thing but mm. surrender to the fruits of that action whatever, yes. however they may turn out Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, which again is, is 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 the freedom, 
the, the freedom to create and to be from that space because you're not necessarily clinging doggedly to the outcome. You know? Yeah, you're not, that's the key. And you're, you're, yeah, and you're even maybe not, you know, certainly I often feel like this, is you're not totally invested in the idea that you're wholly doing that yourself. Right, absolutely you know? important um, point because you're not. Yeah. Whenever I've written anything that people go, wow, you know, that was a really good poem or, you know, how did you come up with that idea in that play or, you know, how did you do that? You know, I have to, if I'm really honest, I go, I don't really know. There's an element of mystery to it, you know, yeah. because in actual fact, when you're really writing well, most of what you're doing is letting go and getting out of the way. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of, you know, there's there's one right. Um, writer who writes about the process of writing called Julia Cameron. She's written The Artist's Way and uh, probably some people have heard of her. And um, and she talks about it as taking dictation. Yeah, but, you know, very good. When she gets out of the way, she just listens and she almost is more, she's more listening than writing, she's writing down what she hears, you know, she's writing down what's coming through her. Um, then it's really fun. It's really playful because it loses its seriousness. It's not like, well, yes, of course, you know, I'm very clever because I wrote that. And, you know, I'm, you know, the, the only way I could do that is because I'm incredibly, you know, um, creative and intelligent. And yes, I, aren't, I, aren't I wonderful? You know? <laughs> it's just yeah. it's never felt right. You know? It's just, a, well, actually, I don't really know. It's a strange mystery, you know. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's, and that ties into the whole thing of, you know, no, no, no personal self and no sense of self and all. It's like, you know, which again is one of those nuanced understandings, ideally, where sure there's some sense of a self, but it's not like predominant and at least for, for me anyway, um, and for many people, like, um, who is it? Francis always says, he says, you know, of course you're a person, you're just not only a person. Um, yeah, you're not merely, you're not merely a, um, you know, a person, you know, yeah, you're not just, not just a person here, you know, you're, you're the, the absolute appearing as the relative, you know. Yeah. So your relative personhood is serving as an instrument or a conduit or something, but there's a much larger intelligence that's actually running yes. the show. Which is a completely different way of experiencing life compared to I'm only this little me. You yeah. know, I'm only, it's just me here. You know, nothing means anything. You know, there's no <laughs> point in anything because, you know, life's hard and uncomfortable and uh -huh. we're all going to die. You know, um, it's a completely different, you know, as as you know is it completely different to just being nothing mm -hmm. well i'm just pure consciousness pure being there's no one here no self here um it's all just an illusion you know um which on one level it is but it's a re relatively real illusion you know yeah try something. telling that to your partner if he or she you know has a problem with something that you you're doing say oh it's you're just an illusion and <laughs> i'm not really there's really no me doing that you yeah, know yeah. so lighten it's up it's quite a quick way to lose a lot of friends you know <laughs> <laughs> you didn't turn up we had a meeting to drink the other day now oh no 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 i, I was not really here you know <laughs> yeah, there is no meeting there was no <laughs> <laughs> exactly um so uh yeah it's um it's to me it just feels very much like part of a part of a just you know much larger and more enjoyable process you know that i really feel that um at this point in in my my own journey um uh this is this is where you know, the real juice and pith and you know zest of life is is um is just in in, in um you know what's it like you know because i constantly think now well you know if, if I'm experiencing something, what what's it like um, to live in, in an awakened space with that? It's, it's just some different words to use it. But, you know, if I feel um, anxious about something or um, uh, bored or, you know, if there's a problem in my life, a situation, a, a difficulty with somebody, um, a relationship problem or whatever, um, is, well, how is, where's my awakening now? Then what difference is that making? Yeah. Um, and you're able just, to sort of shift into it a little bit more, but yeah, just kind of exactly. fall back on the self, so to speak. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, is that it's always, you know, the solution now. Yeah. You know, the, the solution is always at the root, the root, the solution is always the same. Um, and it might be that something resolves itself um, just because I spend a little bit of time just being. I might meditate for 20 minutes mm -hmm. or just sit and write, you know, sit and look at the trees go and sit in the park and just look at the sky um, or go and do something which, you know, is enjoyable, um, yet doesn't really require an awful lot of, you know, mental focus. Yeah. And some of these things can resolve or even taking something into, um, you know, a, a, a practice of surrender. You know, Francis really teaches a lot about surrender and that's 
a huge part of um, uh, integrating any kind of deep awakening, I think, is that you go through this process of um, allowing, accepting, letting things be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I can feel in my own being when I'm not doing that, because it's suddenly things become, you know, constricted and difficult and mm -hmm. things just aren't working well. There's less flow, you know, there's, things aren't flowing as well. And then you realize, ah, oh, okay, I'm obviously holding on to something. Yeah. It's kind of like riding a bicycle. There's always a balance thing going on, um, mm. you know, and it becomes almost automatic after a while, as it does with riding a bicycle. You don't have to think about it, but you're still balancing, you know, you're still kind of yeah. steering around potholes and correcting for things and this and that. Um, and what I mean by that analogy is just that, um, you know, there are a lot of things which do have to be dealt with and you can't just sort of hide out in the transcendent. I remember I was yeah. dri driving along with my mother one time and the car broke down and um, I kind of just sat on the side of the road and opened the Shankara book and started reading it. <laughs> this is back in, <laughs> back in the 70s, you know, yeah. and, and uh, it's like I, I wasn't dealing with the situation. <laughs> uh, I can probably think of many other examples in my life like that. Um, so there are times to sort of fall back in, into the absolute or into the, you know, the more unbounded perspective and, and you know things are going to kind of work themselves out. And there are times to take action. I mean, in, yeah. it, to quote the Bhagavad Gita again, Arjuna at one point said to Krishna, can't I just sort of like, you know, live on alms and forget about this whole battle thing that you want me to do? And, and Arjuna said, no, this is something you're going to, uh, Krishna said, no, this is something you're going to have to deal with, actually. But, um, but the way he put it was, well, get established in being first and then perform mm -hmm. action. And then mm -hmm. from that foundation, you'll do the right thing. Yeah, exactly. And that is just such a great comfort. You know, when, 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 you, when you sort of know this on a certain level, um, because for me, I knew this for a couple of years very much on the level of the mind. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I had, I, you know, I think, this is just my opinion, but I think a lot of modern um, expressions of non-duality or modern expressions of spiritual teaching sometimes, I think they actually require quite a good intellect yeah. in order to follow the conceptual sort of game of, unraveling the mind with the mind you know mm -hmm. sort of using that thing and so um you know i had a good mind in that sense to be able to conceptually follow these sort of ab sometimes quite abstract you know sort of expressions um, and so definitely for a while there was this clarity and understanding in in the mind about this and almost if you like an awakened mind but then there had to be some you know embodiment of that um and that's really where this you know process of of, you know, like you say, balancing and, you know, surrendering and returning to and trusting it as well, you know, um, because I feel that there's a, there comes a point when you know all of this stuff, if you've had a, if you've had a deep awakening, you know, genuine sort of insight to things, and that's starting to become an abiding thing, then I, I, I think there's a sense that you know this through being it, mm -hmm. you know, that you sort of, I just don't, I'm knowing it through the being of it. And then that is, I think, is, is what you're talking about, that there's this sense of you just sort of adjust it. And, and you're doing that, like you say, f from the perspective of being, the ground of being. And so that's just such a comforting thing to me that I think, ah, OK, if I, if I feel I'm getting, you know, um, carried away here or, or sort of, you know, swept up. I keep thinking of this analogy of being swept up by the river of, you know, stuff. Um, I can just remind myself that actually, you know, there's an, essence, there's an element of my beingness which is untouched by any of that it's it's sort of undisturbed and is the capacity holding all of it and then you go ah oh, of course you know then it sort of becomes easier mm. i think and more skillful and more effective even if part of that balancing is you've got to go out there into great battle with something or someone yeah interesting there's a couple of stories which come to mind um one is from i forget some these are both sort of vedic things but one is that it was said that when brahma the creator first emerged from the unmanifest and he 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 looked around and he he was supposed to be the creator but he couldn't create didn't know what to do and mm -hmm. or how to do it and and the voice came um to do tapas or to you know go within and so he kind of went within uh, for uh, in these stories for you know eons and and then <laughs> from from having drawn back like that he was able to come out and create and there's another say another saying which is uh, i think from krishna I, I, I people pardon me please for quoting all these hindu things but it's kind of what i'm familiar with where he says 
taking recourse to my own nature, I create again and again. So, oh, so again, there's the principle that. of you know taking recourse. It's like mm. drawing the arrow back on the bow and then mm. shooting it, shooting it forward. Taking recourse mm. to my own nature, I create again and again. And that's beautiful, and that that I think is um, very very nicely sums up what we're talking about there. Yeah. That actually we're drawing from you know being, if you like, God is creating out of itself mm -hmm. again and again and again for the sheer joy of it. Yeah. For yeah. the thrill and the, and the enjoyment of it, you know, for the love of it, you know, um, because it can, you know, um, and that's just such a, um, you know, it's such a completely different way of experiencing life to previously where I felt life was happening to me. I couldn't get ahead. Things were just difficult. You know, the way was always blocked, never satisfied and fulfilled and just dreadfully unhappy. And um, yeah. And you know, um, stressed and tense all the time. You know. And if that's the way God operates, and if we're made in the image of God, to throw yes. another Bible quote at you, uh, yes, then yes. then you know we're like a little miniature version of the principles I just explained. Yes. Uh, it works that way in us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is, um, you know, which is the great good news. You know, that, yeah. that's that's what it is. It's not. You know, when we do look around the world, we've got oh, all these, you know, these sort of, you know, ideas of, of God and, you know, what they're telling us to do in this church and that church. Well, really, that's just us having created God in our image. Right. You know, you know, you know the God who says you can't do this and you can't Not do that. Not the other way around. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, you know, and there may be a there may be an inherent ethical approach and, an, and, and you know, and a morality that comes with, you know, being this free creating force. I have no doubt in my mind about that, that there is an, an ethical nature to this this beingness, this, mm -hmm. this, you know, this Brahma that we are, whatever we would call it. Um, but that it, you know, but not in the way, not in man's idea of morality or ethics, you know, right, it's sort right. of, it's sort of, yeah, we do create it in our expressions of it, but I think it's God given in that sense. So, yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. If I were to try to put that ethical nature that you just alluded to into words, it would be that there's an, a sort of an evolutionary imperative to the universe, an evolutionary tra trajectory um, yeah. that, might seem ruthless and cruel at times, but the, the, if you step back far enough and see the big picture, there's this sort of ever-evolving, ever-complexifying, mm. ever-more full expression of divine intelligence in the world, through the world. Yeah, indeed. And that, that, that whatever that you know, ethical framework or essence is, that it's intelligent. Like you say, it's a divine intelligence, mm. um, which is very different, I think, often from the morality that, that, you know, human beings concern themselves with in terms of, you know, conflict and debate and this is right and that is wrong, you know, right. but there's a sort of like, and it's almost like an unquestionable, um, you know, uh, um, sort of provenance, an unquestionable sort of ring of truth about that sort of ethical approach, which actually, in, in a way, it's, it's like, we, you know, if we are this beingness, if we are the, you know, the essence of God, if we are this open heart, this clear, unconditional openness that we might call God, well, then it's its own authority. Yeah. You know, it's almost like, well, in a way, you know, that that's what informs your ethical approach in the world. Or that's what informs, you know, your your um, you know, relationships to other people. So, like you say, coming back again to what was that quote about the book? Oh, um, Brahma taking that? recourse to my own nature, I create again and again. Yeah. Yeah, it's like going back each time, returning to that essence of ourselves, reminding ourselves, remembering who we are, mm -hmm. and then going out again in the world. It's like that. It seems to me that's the that, if you like, is the um, the cycle of of all of this. Is you know, and it just goes on kind of deeper and deeper levels as as a, a you know person's life you know unfolds. Yeah, very good. Um, so you give meetings around the UK and you do Skype consultations with people and all what do you actually do with people in these meetings and consultations well well i don't really give many meetings um in the uk okay. um but maybe you'd I like thought, to give more if you were yeah, invited. maybe, I would, maybe. Yeah. if i was invited to talk on something i might um mm -hmm. i um initially when i first started writing the blog i um, was invited to give a few talks mm -hmm. um and initially i felt that the role of teacher just wasn't um for me right um in hindsight, I realized there was an awful lot I still needed to sort of integrate within myself in order to have any sort of real confidence in, in you know, in teaching as such. Um, uh, but I'd certainly, I've, you know, will uh, write my blog and talk to people via 
that one on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and for a while, I um, was consulting with people via Skype. That's still available. I, you know, people, if people want to talk to me mm -hmm. via Skype um, and, and, and you know discuss or ask questions or ask for guidance in, in, in you know this awakening journey. Um, I will do that. But for a number of years, I decided to just step away from all of that mm -hmm. um, and you know, focus on living my own life aside from sort of putting myself out there as someone, you know, to talk about things and teach. Sure. And I, I get a sense that, you know, probably my own expression will naturally fall more into the creative field. I don't know. Um, but I like talking about this um, and I certainly have a passion for um, you know, assisting people who are perhaps already on this journey. Um, uh, and for, but just to talking from my own experience and what works for me. Yeah. You know, one thing you might enjoy doing um, is just, and you have the technical skills to set this up on Zoom or whatever, is just mm. doing a little webinar thing once a month or something where, mm. you know, people can either join for free or you, you ask for a modest donation or, or something voluntarily. <laughs> and you just talk for a bit and then let people throw in their two cents and you just get a little discussion going with 15 or 20 people. Um, yeah. yeah, you might enjoy that. Yeah, indeed. No, I'm sure I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Good. Certainly a good idea. Great. Well, mm -hmm. thanks, Mike. Is there anything that comes to mind that we sh haven't covered that you want to mention before we wrap it up? Um, I don't think so. No. Yeah. Um, I was going to read one one poem. Actually, oh, please do. Um, which um, it's just difficult to know which one to choose, but I'll choose. Um, uh, actually, this one I'll choose because it's one of my favourite ones. So, um, so this is something I wrote probably about six months ago, maybe seven months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I just often will write poetry expressing this sort of stuff. You know, sometimes it's not always this stuff. But um, so this is called Gloriously I Am. If you are here as the prickles in my skin and as the sensation of my own breath entering and leaving my body, and if you are here as the carpet and the sofa and the dwindling bottle of wine and the ticking or marching or bending of time. And if you are here as the memory of autumn beech leaves and of conkers and of my dear sweet friend Peter walking twin like with me round and round the playing fields. And if you are here as the sound of these fingers tinkle tapping their dance across the screen. And if you are here as the beautiful face I kiss and the beautiful hand I hold, and the soft, sweet care of his heart. And if you are here as the ground on which I walk, and the skin in which I'm in, and the crazy, screwed up, messed up, wired up mind that just does its own bloody thing. And if you are here as everything that could be named, or not named, or claimed, or not claimed, as every thought, every memory, every person, movement, sound, taste, and smell, well, I am gloriously lost for words. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that gives people a nice taste of your writing ability. Um, you know, I've listened to another number of things in the last few days of, that you had written that were just really nice and enjoyable. I hope you keep writing. Yeah, same here. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks. Um, I really Thank appreciate you. it. It's been an en a really uh, enjoyable conversation for me and hopefully for the, the listeners. Hopefully, yeah. I really enjoyed it too. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Sure. Let me make a few little wrap-up points. Um, so I've been speaking with Mike Jenkins. Um, those of you who are familiar with the show know everything that I'm about to say. Those of you who are new to it, um, I'll just say a few things. Uh, this is an ongoing series of interviews. If you'd like to be notified of future ones, go to batgap.com and you'll see a place to sign up to be notified by email uh, when new ones are released. Or you could subscribe on YouTube and YouTube will notify you when I put up new ones. And explore the site there at Batgap. Look under the at a glance menu and you'll you'll see a summary of some of the things that are available. And donate button is there as I mentioned in the beginning it enables us to, to devote all our time to this um, so I really appreciate your attention listening to or watching this and um, we will continue to schedule them and do this we've had we've got them scheduled through late September now not entirely every week but some some go that far out and um, it's a great uh, honor and pleasure to 
be able to produce this series and to meet so many wonderful people. I'm, I'm the prime beneficiary of this. <laughs> it's my, my selfish little secret. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate it. And uh, it's been great getting to know you, Mike. Perhaps we'll meet in person one of these days. Thank you. Yes, that would be nice. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. So thanks to everybody who's been listening or watching, and we'll see you next yeah. time. Thank you.